Today we have a very special guest, Jennifer Lammers. For those who don't know, Jen is an award-winning journalist and television personality and an anchor on Good Daily and Fox 11. She was a correspondent on Extra, a syndicated television news magazine reporting entertainment news from 2019 to 2023. Before joining Extra, Jen conquered Good Day Wake Up on Fox 5 in New York City and was a reporter and weekend anchor at several local television stations. Jen is an Ohio native, grew up always wanting to work in news and television. I know you guys will get so much out of this episode with that. Jen, it's so great to have you on. Welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. You have such an inspiring story. Your career is incredible. And I do believe that your story is a true testament that with determination, passion, and focus, you can achieve great success. But in case I missed anything, can you please introduce yourself to the audience? I mean, you did a fantastic job. That That's oh. it. Yeah. So currently, I've had a news background since I was, wow, probably about 20 years old. So I've been doing this now for for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh, started off in small markets, and then yeah, I, I, I came over to co-host Good Day LA from six to nine in the morning uh, on the Fox station here in Los Angeles. It's a it's a legacy show that I'm very proud to be taking over. It's it's a lot of pride and a big privilege for me to be able to say that I'm in this position right now. That's incredible. I know that at some point in your career, you actually took a step back for a few years, like around five years, when you worked at a golf cable television startup with your then husband. Then as the marriage ended, you moved back to Ohio, lived with your family, but then took a leap of faith, moved to New York City, determined to become an anchor, I'm just curious, have you ever doubted yourself and your career in general? Oh, of course. I mean, many, many moments. And that was a big one. Um, so, you know, when I when I got divorced, this was a few years ago, uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know exactly how to do it. So the last place I wanted to move was back with my parents in Ohio. Thankfully, they made it a safe space for me to come back and, and take a beat in between getting the divorce, because at that point I was working at Back Nine Network, which is now a defunct golf lifestyle TV network that my then husband was the CEO of. I was the correspondent there. And I put all of my, basically my whole identity was wrapped up in that job and in that marriage. So when that ended, I lost my house. I uh, lost my job. Uh, so I made the decision to come back, take a beat, move in with my family. And that was for about a month. And I had some time at that point to figure out what what is the next step going to be for me. And I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to make a, what I thought in my head at the time was a lateral move. Uh, I didn't want to go back to a smaller local market because frankly, I feel like I had spent too much time and on it, on my career, and I had worked too hard. So I owed it to myself to take a huge leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And I thought of no better place than the most uncomfortable place in the world at that point, which was New York City. Uh, I had been there a few times in the past. I loved it. I always considered it. This could be a home for me. Every time I visited, I just felt this pull to the city. So I made the decision to contact an, uh, an old uh, general manager who I used to work with in Connecticut. He was now the general manager at the PIX11 station in New York reached out to him, tried to see if there's any, any positions that he had open, came in for an interview. Uh, I got hired there as a freelance uh, reporter and I was all set to go. And then uh, my, my agent actually set me up with Imad Asghar and Byron Harmon, who were the assistant news director and the news director at the Fox 5 station in New York. And they met with me and, and I, you know, at that point, I was feeling pretty vulnerable and emotional. And I just, I told them the reason that I was coming to them, the reason that I wanted to work in New York City uh, and the length of my career. And they just, there was something about that story that they later on said, 
struck them in a way that they were like, we've got to give her a chance uh, because we've both been in positions like this before. We've just gotten kicked in the gut uh, and felt like our only option was to shoot for the moon. So I got hired there as a freelance uh, reporter, permalance, they called it. So I would have like a Monday to Friday position, but it would, I wouldn't get any benefits. And I was okay with that. I, I, at that point I was like, I will take whatever <laughs> you give me. So yeah, so I, I, I packed up my stuff and I moved to New York City uh, with just a roll of toilet paper and an air mattress to my name. Got and I used the the money that that uh, I sold my ring, I sold my car, uh, and the money that I got from that I then put on a down payment for a studio apartment on the Upper East Side, and so I moved in there. And I remember for the first oh my gosh the first four days that I <laughs> was living there, I found like three cockroaches per day in my in my apartment, That's and I was awful. thinking oh my god what have I done. Um, it was just one of those like starter New York apartments that you're just, I will desperate to like, just get a piece of real estate in like the biggest, best city in the world. So I did it. And, you know, I worked hard enough to where I, I earned a, uh, a full-time position there with benefits as a reporter. And then I spent another couple of years there and, and the, the news director saw that I was dedicated and was willing to take constructive criticism and feedback and learn from it and grow from it. And, uh, and then, yeah, I was, I was given a, a weekend anchor position with fill in responsibilities to, to anchor on the weekdays and the audience responded to me. They seemed to like me. So they then promoted me to co-host good day, wake up with Sukanya Krishnan. Uh, Sukanya was this absolute icon legend of morning television in New York. She had just come over from Fix 11. She had been there for 20 years or more. Um, and I was so intimidated to be walking into this position alongside her. I felt like I didn't deserve it. I was just thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to, this is, which once again, stepping up to the challenge, this is going to be a proving ground for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with sitting next to somebody who I know I'm going to learn from. There was no ego involved there. There was no ego between the two of us. And we just had this like beautiful friendship um, that, that, yeah, I mean, lasted two years before we both moved on to, to other, other positions. Um, but it was like lightning in a bottle, the two of us. I really looked fondly on that time that we had together and just that whole time in New York in general. Would you say that it was the most pivotal moment in your career? Yes, yes. New York was the most pivotal moment in my life because I really feel like I, I moved there when I turned 30 and, you know, coming into my own and hitting my stride. New York, New York helped me discover myself. It, is, it helped me discover who I've always been and what I owe to myself. Um, I had a lot of fun there. I met some really amazing people who I have lifelong friendships with. I just, to me, it's still my favorite city in the world for that reason, because I feel like I would not be here where I am today without uh, being gifted the privilege of, of living in that city for five years. Would you ever move back to New York City? Oh, if the, if the opportunity were right for myself and now my family to consider, my son, and my future husband, um, yeah, I would, I definitely would. And I've, you know, that that's no secret. I, it's always <laughs> been, it's always been a place where my heart has, has been. That's amazing. You've mentioned that, you know, through your career, you're always open for constructive feedback, criticism. I read that at some point someone told you that you don't have a voice for TV and you have to give up. Yeah. I cannot believe someone would say something like this, especially to you, but what was your reaction? Oh, uh, I was in college when this was, this was Fred Kite that you're talking about. Fred Kite was my, was my first boss. I would consider him my first boss. I worked at WOUB in Athens, Ohio, uh, um, in, in, at Ohio University, and I was doing weekend morning 
radio. And he said, your voice is too high pitched. It's, it's, uh, it's too nasal. You don't belong in this business. Maybe consider doing something else. And I took that and yes, okay. I mean, I was hurt. It was kind of the first, the first time I had ever heard feedback like that from anybody and it hurt. Um, but I internalized it and I, and I, you know, made sure that I learned something from that. Okay. Well, you know, it, it might feel insulting and whatever his motivation was for saying that I have no idea. I still have no idea. Uh, but all I know is that I made sure to practice and practice and, and be willing to hear myself. Uh, which a lot of people that's hard to do. It's, it's hard to kind of go over their own material because it is, it can be so cringeworthy, especially when you're first starting out in your career. I've always been extremely hard on myself. I've always been my own worst critic. Uh, there's nothing that anybody can tell me that I haven't already known and internalized myself and, and recognized. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I took that as, Yes, it was a gut punch, but I I grew from that, and I and I made sure that I did a better job after that. That's fascinating to me because when I look at you, you always sound so like very conversational, very engaged with the audience, and for me, it looks like it's just so natural to you that it was yeah. given. But now I can definitely see that you put a lot of work. Do you have any tips like on how to be a better communicator, being more comfortable presenting and being in public? Absolutely. Um, my number one advice would be find your own voice, find what feels comfortable for you, your own perspective, uh, find what, what feels most authentic to who you are and go with that because I spent the good majority of the beginning part of my career trying to fit a mold and trying to be somebody that I wasn't. Part of the reason that I left extra, to be perfectly honest, is I didn't feel like I was being authentic to myself. Celebrity news is always something that I had a passive interest in, but it's not something that I ever wanted to make a career out of. So I, I kind of listened to that voice that, that was inside of me, which is, be, you are not better than anybody else. Um, you are not better than the guy that you walk across on the street, than the janitor that you see working in your building, uh, than the person who's cleaning toilets. You're not better than any of them. We were all put on this earth. We all have to coexist on this earth. And I think that because I grew up in such a humble way, my parents are both uh, my dad was a construction worker for many, many years. My mom, uh, you know, worked at a restaurant. They never went to college. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I grew up with essentially nothing, everything that I needed, but not everything that I wanted. So I think my Ohio beginnings and, and not having much and recognizing that there are, that, that, that's the majority of, of America. That's the majority of people that you encounter every single day, uh, if they're lucky. So just recognizing that and, and, and approaching every situation with that honesty and transparency is something that's given me the confidence to be able to be comfortable on live television every day. Speaking about live television and, you know, the entertainment industry in general, is everything scripted or you actually have control of the narrative? how you do those interviews, what questions you ask. Such a, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and that, that's something that a lot of people might not know, uh, unless they're inside the entertainment space, work in the red carpet as a correspondent. I, a, a lot of the entertainment industry from like the news magazine perspective is PR driven. So I'll give you an example. You, you want to you wanna interview, and this is just an example, Jamie Lynn Spears, right? Say you want to interview her, she's on, she was on Special Forces or she was on Dancing with the Stars. I think she was on, just on Dancing with the Stars. You will have somebody pull you aside right before you talk to her and say absolutely no Britney Spears questions. Um, there are a lot of like rules and regulations that are in place surrounding celebrity talent that I don't think a lot of people understand when they're watching it. 
we have ways of getting around it. We have different agenda, different questions that we can that we can ask um, to kind of lightly approach the topic and then edit it to make it seem like we maybe have asked those uncomfortable agenda driven questions. But it is very much so PR driven. If you say something that's going to uh, upset a celebrity, you never know if that publicist then represents other bigger celebrities mm -hmm. who they will withhold. And this has happened before they will withhold on the red carpet because you might have upset their other celebrity client. So that's kind of how it works. There's a lot of like behind the scenes politics that are involved. I can definitely relate to that because I represent a lot of executives, senior leadership, and every time we would do interviews, obviously we would like choose who would be the best reporter, what publication, outlet, questions, everything right. is rehearsed, everything is written, and to the point that you just mentioned, if their journalist will ask something that was not agreed upon, Probably for other clients we have, we're not going to give an exclusive to this person. Yeah. We'll go with someone else. So I've been there. <laughs> oh, yeah. You've been on that side of it for sure. So, so you know you know what it means to, um, to withhold maybe some other clients of yours because things didn't go well with, with one particular client that you were trying to do publicity for. It's, it's tough. It, makes our, it certainly makes the job of an entertainment correspondent very difficult. And it's even more complex now because they don't need us anymore. The celebrity can just go on their Instagram or their TikTok or their, their X, I guess now it's X, um, and say whatever they want to say and control that narrative. Yeah, that's uh, so true. And even like in strategic communication space, before it was just us, but now it's all the media, as right. you said, all the social networks. And it's not easy to have control over the narrative at this point. And sometimes people think they don't need any advisors because they can do everything themselves. Yeah. You've interviewed so many successful and well-known people. Do you ever feel nervous before interviewing those people? Maybe you have some tools that help you to stay grounded and less anxious? Yeah. I, I, oh, of course. I mean, I've, I've interviewed A-list celebrities before and it's always exciting, especially the Brad Pitts and the George Clooney's of the world and the Charlize Theron's. They have their own like seemingly gravitational pull on the red carpet. Like you can tell when they're arriving before you ever see them, you know, it's the closest thing I would say to an aura that I've ever witnessed. Um, and that can make you, in, it, it can be a very intimidating space to be a part of. Uh, which is why I, I always find myself like the night before, if I ever did a, a red carpet or a junket interview, I would always um, over prepare. I would look up every little detail, every detail about their career. You can't do that, obviously, with everybody because of time constraints. But the most that I could do to me was all about preparation. Um, and that way I can go into the interview with as much confidence as possible, as opposed to uh you know kind of winging it and, and even if you do win, wing it sometimes that makes for the best content mm -hmm. because you know we're human beings we make mistakes and sometimes you you might learn something from somebody uh you might ask a question that that other reporters or correspondents are too afraid to ask because they think well i should know this already not necessarily maybe it's a question that you ask that they've never told anybody before you never know mm -hmm. What was it like to interview Oprah? I couldn't not <laughs> ask this question. Okay, so first of all, that's a crazy story. I um, got this assignment last minute because uh, the, the correspondent who was supposed to go in the first place got COVID. So I jumped in and I was like, it's Oprah? Yes. Uh, we, I flew, how many hours was it to Toronto? Eight hours to Toronto? Uh, to sit down with Oprah for five minutes, oh, and, that's which is fine. Minutes. Which which is fine. I would I would fly the other side of the freaking world to interview Oprah for five minutes. Um, I was yes, that was like a very intimidating experience. But I will say this immediately, as soon as I walked in the room, she stood up. She gave me a big hug. Hi Jennifer, how are you? Made made me feel like she already knew me. That there was this comfort level there. Um. 
And so I, I asked her a few questions and I knew, I knew that there was the, the one question that I was tasked to ask. She was talking about a documentary that she did and she was alongside the director. And that was the purpose of the interview. And it was only five minutes long. These interviews are so quick. And I knew that the, the, the one question that asked, extra wanted me to ask was, how do you feel with the queen's passing, seeing Prince Harry and, and William reunited? <laughs> because she did that, that interview with, with uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And she had a lovely response to it. And that interview later went extremely viral, like all outlets picked it up. But I was just so, so terrified to ask that question. And after I did, I was happy, sure. But she just diffused the situation so much just by using a name, just by remembering your name and using it in conversation. It, it made it more personal. Mm -hmm. It made it relatable. Um, and then at the, at the very end, I said, Oprah, I can't believe I'm sitting across from you right now. I, this is a dream come true. You have to understand. I know you've heard that a million times, but I have just looked up to you my entire career. And she said, you know, you want a picture, right? And I was like, yes, I do, please. <laughs> and I left my freaking phone in, the, in my bag on the outside of the room. And we just had one of her publicists, like take a photo and then she texted it to me. But I, I was like, I was just so grateful for, for that moment probably one of the highlights of my career, if I'm being honest, just to get a, a front row seat at her magic because she has built this like most incredible career being able to relate to people. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's a place that I am always working toward getting to, but she has mastered it. So it was really, it was, it was like getting a front row seat to watching a master in action, I guess is the best way that I can describe it. Was it the most memorable moment in your career and the most memorable interview or there is one of, yeah, I would say, I mean, the, most, the, the, I would say the memorable ones always stick out to me as be, and they weren't even like, I would say like not Oprah level, but they're always the ones where you, you get to see a different side of them that like maybe nobody else gets to see. Uh, but that aside, it's like, I, <laughs> I never really got, as much of a thrill from interviewing even A-list celebrities as I do from the feedback and the, and the connection that I'm making with an audience, for example, like right now, like, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I walk outside the studio and I'm walking down the street, going to the grocery store or getting my car cleaned and I, and someone comes up to me and they say, I really love watching you in Melbourne in the morning. Like you guys make me laugh to me. That's so much more rewarding and fulfilling than any A-list celebrity interview that I could ever do. It, that, that is just me being perfectly honest with you. Am I correct in saying that the most fulfilling part of the work that you do right now is that feedback from people that you made their day better, you made them yeah. laugh or... Yes, yes, that is, so, that is so true, especially with the time that we're living in right now. It's so you feel the weight of what's happening overseas. It's inescapable. You see it everywhere. You see it on every major news outlet. You see it on social media and you can just feel it. It's actually tangibly heavy. Um, and if, if I can put a smile on someone's face in some way, make them laugh, take them out of that for just a second, then I've done my job, you know, and also let them know about what's going on. <laughs> That's important to like their day and traffic and weather and all that stuff. But but to me, most importantly, is like, if I can make you smile and just give you that little rush of endorphins or something that makes you go, oh my gosh, same, you know, sitting at home uh, when you're trying to like, you know, pack your kid's lunch and like, you know, figure out how you're going to walk your dog later on in the morning. It's like, there's so much chaos that happens in the course of someone's morning that it is a privilege to be invited into their home. Uh, I look at that as a privilege that I will never, ever take for granted. So I'm so grateful for like, the audience that we have, the people who reach out and, and say that, you know, I'm a part of their, their morning routine or their daily life. It's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. What is the most challenging part of the work that you do? Because it's not easy. I know you wake up very early. Mm -hmm. We were emailing back and forth at 4 a.m. your time. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep deprivation is a big, is a big problem with nearly anyone you talk to who does morning news. Um, I would say 
this is so the biggest the, the biggest challenge for me in my career, especially the latter part of my career, has been setting boundaries for myself and understanding how much I can take and being able to prioritize prioritize things in my life that never really, frankly, had priority before. When I had a son, it changed my entire world. He's two years old now. And I look at life completely differently. I, I look at um, my career has taken a backseat to him. He is number one, always and forever in my life. I will do anything for him. I will move mountains for him if I could. I would make decisions that are that otherwise would be excruciating for me to make in my career. You know, you're always looking for that next step. Um, but now that he's here, as long as he's happy and and cared for and feels loved uh, and and is getting enough of me, that's all I care about. And, and setting those boundaries is, was very difficult. It was very difficult to leave extra. Uh, because I looked at extra as this is syndicated television is almost like that's where you want to be. If you're going to be in television, like that's where you want to be in every household in America. Um, and I looked at that as like a pinnacle. That was something that I had, I had hoped to achieve in my life that, that I was looking at as like a, a launch pad to maybe other opportunities. Um, but just everything changed when he came along. And now I, my number one priority was like that work-life balance where, because as we were saying earlier, if you're trying to be good for everybody, you're good to nobody. You can't stretch yourself so thin to where you are not doing the job that you want to be doing for any one particular person aspect in your life. And for me, it was, it was him. Um, I, I, found myself, I was working really long hours, unpredictable hours at extra. And, uh, and I just knew that I had to, I had to set some boundaries and, and this working a morning show is going to be great for him long-term because, you know, that means I'll get to see him when he gets off the bus from school. And that's important. It's important for me. Would you say that your definition of success because again like it's very subjective right like it's to have a family yeah. now to have your son and to be happy in the present yeah if i do nothing else in my life i i know that i did enough because of him that's beautiful it's it's true it's true he's just every you know i never really like saw myself as being a mother, because especially when you have, you know, a career that takes you all over the place and is really demanding and all consuming like television, I'm sure you also know in the space that you're in, um, you know, having kids is not necessarily always the focus, but once it happened, my gosh, I was just, I just thought this is what I meant to do. <laughs> this is what I meant to do. You know, it's just so rewarding in levels that you can't even really explain. It's incredible how life can change in like eight, nine years. I think yeah. since you you moved to New York City and then LA, now you have a family. Right. Would you ever imagine your career to unfold this way? If you look back, that in no. eight years you will be who you are now. It's it's it is a beautiful thing to to wonder, but to not know. Um, when I first moved to LA, I remember I cried myself to sleep that first night because it was so quiet and I was so used to just like the, the din of like the cars going by and the people outside your window and just like that constant frenetic energy that is New York city for it to be just like dead silent. <laughs> That's kind of how it felt like you were in like a little bit of a vacuum and I, it was just, uh, it was crushing to me because I was like, did I make the wrong decision? I was questioning myself so hard that first, those first few weeks, but especially that first night, like I turned the light off and it never seemed so dark as that first night that I was in Los Angeles. And I was just so questioning, you know, every decision that had led me here. Like, is this where my heart is? Is this where I need to be? And then you fast forward even three short years later, you know, having a partner who loves me, finding someone, which is like, you know, in Los Angeles, like finding a needle in a haystack. I can't even tell yeah, you. It's impossible. Um, it's impossible. <laughs> I have some experience, so I can say it's impossible. Right? Do you know the struggle's real? Um, 
So doing that and then, and then creating this beautiful life and, and being a mom and becoming that, becoming that, that person that I had always looked up to in my mother. Um, it's just, I never, I never thought it would ever happen. I really just assumed that, okay, I'll just be that. I'll be the cool aunt. I'll be the girl who's like, you know, watches all of her friends, like get married and have kids. And I'll just, you know, come in, come out and just be the cool aunt that gets to take them on all the fun trips and like, you know, buys them all the, all the cool, expensive stuff. (laughs) But this is just so much better than anything that I could have ever dreamed up for myself. Truly. So what's next for you? Next, you know, just because I'm a mother doesn't mean I've, I've stopped dreaming of, of career goals. I still have goals in mind that I want to, that I want to hit. I keep those goals to myself just because (laughs) it's, it's for a number of reasons, right? It's like, uh, those goals can change. I mean, they can definitely change, but also, um, I just think it's, it's something that I like to work privately toward. And if I put it out there in the, in the world, there's like a small, like, you know, Italian Catholic part of me that believes in, in superstition. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I like to, I like to keep that to myself, but it does involve television very much so. And you're right. Sometimes, obviously you grow, you evolve, your choices change, your Mm -hmm. career aspirations change, but then when you say it out loud to people like i want to do that and then a year later the same people will question oh didn't you want to do this right right well it's like hey life happens you know that's the way that's the way the world works sometimes exactly the last question that i have is do you have any advice for our audience it can be anything career related personal, maybe a motto that you follow in life, anything that comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, there's always a quote that comes to mind. Anytime I think about stuff like this, any, any life change, major life change, any tough time that you go through, instead of asking yourself, why is this happening to me? Ask yourself, why is this happening for me? Because there's always a lesson that you can learn. There's always growth that can happen along the way and always listen to that listen to your gut because it will never steer you wrong. Trust and believe that it will never steer you down the wrong path. There is a reason that your gut sometimes is screaming at you to do something, whether it's like a career change or, or a private move, or even if it just means like staying away from a certain person, like just always trust that because it's there for a reason. It's so beautiful. Jen, it was incredible speaking with you. Thank you for being so kind, humble, honest, and all the great advice that you shared and for your support with this podcast. I really congratulations on the podcast. That's also like one of those big moves that we talk about, you know? You trusted your gut there and and good for you. I know you're gonna have a lot of success in it. 